So, so I'm not here to sell you anything, so don't worry about that. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk <clears throat> about stratosphere or um, what we are calling it nowadays um, Apache Flink. So, first of all, what is Flink? Um, so recently, so Stratosphere is, is an open source system and we recently moved it to the Apache Incubator uh, process of the Apache Software Foundation and uh, because there's a, an Apache Stratos project, we probably have to change our name and Flink is the most uh, probable name. Um, Flink is German for, for fast and swift and I learned that it's actually the same thing in, in Swedish. So if you, so the first thing is that if you're interested in, you know, following the project, seeing what's happening, following the development, all of that stuff is open and it happens in this mailing list that everyone can subscribe to or you can check the, the archives uh, from the Apache Software Foundation. Now we're in the process of renaming, you know, our code and our artifacts and so on and I did not actually rename my slides. So for this slide set I would still uh, use the name Stratosphere. So what is Stratosphere? So Stratosphere is a general purpose uh, computation engine that runs in Hadoop clusters. So it runs on Hadoop resident data in HDFS and it runs on top of YARN, uh, so next generation Hadoop clusters. Uh, however, it completely replaces and subsumes <coughs> Hadoop MapReduce. It does that, it, it replaces that by an engine whose runtime is uh, database uh, inspired. So the runtime is a hybrid between a MapReduce engine and, a, and an MPP, uh, so a massively parallel database engine, and it contains uh, a query optimizer. However, it is not a SQL on Hadoop solution, so it's a general uh, purpose computation engine. You can use your uh, programming language like Java, Scala, Python is coming up, and so on and so forth. And the focus of the project is, first of all, uh, you know, being orders of magnitude faster than Hadoop MapReduce, and that's actually easy to do. You basically use in-memory as much as possible, you stream data, uh, you, you're smart on how you process the data, and so on and so forth. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there is a focus on uh, ease of use, so really making the developers' uh, life very easy by doing a lot of tuning uh, and optimizations inside the system and by providing easy-to-use uh, elegant APIs. So that's the website. Uh, it will be moved soon, but right now all the information is there, documentation, so on and so forth. And if you're tweeting, uh, go on and follow Stratosphere. Okay, so why do we need something like that? Um, so first of all, you know, big data is, is very nice and everybody wants to do big data. However, companies that have actually been using uh, Hadoop uh, for, for a while, a lot of them have actually felt the pain uh, both in terms of performance and in terms of usability. So they would like to have a solution that runs you know, in the same infrastructure, in the same data, but does not have all these limitations uh, of Hadoop. Now, um, I come from, uh, from a database uh, research uh, background, uh, and when, when Hadoop was coming up, a lot of database researchers were saying that this is really you know, primitive uh, technology, or actually this was the criticism to also Google's MapReduce paper from some you know, uh, major researchers. And, you know, that's, that's, I don't completely agree with that, but it is true that we have been witnessing an, an evolution in the, in the Hadoop open source space where people have been uh, re, reinventing the wheel a bit and essentially uh, you know, bringing uh, technologies that we knew in the data management systems domain to this, uh, to this, to this new world. Uh, Apache Spark is a great example of that. It is Again, a MapReduce replacement that focuses on uh, in-memory computing, so keeping the data uh, as much as possible in-memory. But there are a lot more. So there are many projects that are happening right now in the Hadoop space, like Tez from Hortonworks, uh, some proposals for materialized views that essentially, or, or Apache Optics, so basically bring, they bring a lot of database technology uh, in this world. And um, actually, I think that uh, we can do it better. And you know, otherwise I wouldn't be doing that. We've been working on this uh, for about five years. 
uh, and we, we think that we have some ideas that are unique and that can actually bring this technology in the proper way. Okay, so I am in the unfortunate situation of having the last talk before lunch and I was delayed for about 10 minutes. So I was planning initially to tell you a little bit uh, about how parallel databases work uh, as sort of an introduction to what kinds of technologies people you know, are trying to, to bring in this kind of space. Uh, I will skip that one. Uh, and basically, I mean, if you had a database course at university, you probably know that we have SQL queries that pass through an optimizer and so on, and databases do all, kind, all kinds of magic, like uh, query optimization. So basically, you program logically, and the database system takes your logical program and translates it to the most efficient way to execute it, depending on your hardware and your data characteristics. And it does several things, join reordering, algorithm selection, so if you want to join two tables, for example, you can do that using an nested loop join, or you can exploit the fact that the tables are sorted, or sort them beforehand, and do a sort merge on, so on and so forth. And all that stuff, you know, happens underneath. As a user of the system, you don't care about how you're going to sort your data, how you're going to partition your data, uh, you know, if you're going to place your data in memory, uh, or on disk, the intermediate data, so that, ha that stuff happens automatically. Uh, parallelism uh, in the traditional database world consisted of, again, two things. First, this is a database plan that scans some tables and does some processing. So one thing you can do is, in parallel, execute many parts of this plan. This is called pipeline parallelism, uh, very basic stuff. Uh, the second thing you can do is data parallelism, which is essentially Partition your tables here in multiple chunks. These are the dotted boxes in the background and run many instances of the same plan. And this is essentially what MapReduce exploits, uh, data parallelism. Okay. Uh, so he, this is a very <clears throat> personal view. So I tried to see uh, what is different? Yeah, so you know, people were you were actually analyzing data in parallel using teradata and so on and so forth for many years. Uh, what is different to what people nowadays call big data? What I associate usually with the Hadoop ecosystem. So the first thing is that instead of having data mostly in tables, we have also tables, but we also have uh, a lot of unstructured uh, data in the form of files. And the solution people came up to support this is essentially schema on read. So you don't supply the structure, the metadata about your data up front, but you do it when you actually read it. So it's a more adaptive on-demand approach. The second is that we did have parallel clusters, but now we have more parallel, so more machines. Uh, this stuff was pioneered by Google, so that was an order of magnitude more machines in addition. Uh, these uh, machines were very commodity, so failing uh, very, very often. So you need actually uh, to take into the software, uh, to take the software into account how to, uh, you know, deal with these failures. And uh, what and what people did there uh, was essentially mid query fault tolerance. So while your program is running, if something fails, then you're going to take care of it, and the program will uh, continue. Uh, and these clusters are also uh, shared. So they're shared between many applications. They're not dedicated uh, to the database usually. Uh, so you need uh, you know, a resource allocator, uh, and every application needs to talk to that. <clears throat> In terms of the analysis, uh, so from SQL, we have now, again, SQL. So SQL and Hadoop is, is a huge market. But we also have more. So people actually want to use you know, uh, abstractions in there, uh, embedded in their favorite programming language. Some examples are here, Java, Scala, Python. Essentially, you need to be able to manipulate general objects uh, in your runtime. Uh, in terms of use cases, uh, you know, beyond uh, the classic uh, data warehousing BI, uh, you know, this still exists, but people also want to do some more machine learning on their data. Uh, people have graph structure data, or they create graphs, so they want to analyze the structure, uh, and so on and so forth. And finally, what may be actually, you know, uh, quite important is that the, the data management world used to be 
uh, you know, proprietary. There was, you know, there were a few open source databases like Postgres, but most of the stuff was proprietary. So uh, Oracle, uh, IBM, Microsoft, and so on. And what we see now uh, is that, uh, you know, these new technologies are coming uh, to the open source uh, domain. And that is actually very important. So what we do, can you hear me? Yeah? OK, so uh, what Stratosphere does at a very, very high level is that it takes concepts that we know from the database world, and it takes concepts that we know from the MapReduce world. So it takes uh, the concept of declarativity, so just asking for what you want from a database rather than how exactly it's going to be executed, query optimization, and out-of-core processing, so the ability if your main memory is not enough to spill to, to disk very gracefully. Uh, it takes you know, the, the nice stuff from the MapReduce world, so scalability, user-defined functions as first-class citizens, complex data type schema on read, and on top of it, it adds the ability to natively do iterative processing, so algorithms that contain loops, uh, more advanced data flows on MapReduce, and uh, general type APIs. So this is very high level. How it looks like uh, in the Hadoop stack, so Hadoop, the Hadoop project consists of three things, uh, and uh, perhaps we could even say in order of importance. So the first thing is HDFS, the Hadoop distributed file system, it's where you store your data. The second thing is Yarn, which is this uh, resource manager that every, every application talks to and asks for cluster resources, and the MapReduce engine. Here. So this is a figure from, uh, from the Hortonworks website. Uh, on top of this yarn, there are many other applications besides the Hadoop MapReduce engine uh, that run natively in Hadoop. And Stratosphere is exactly positioned there. So it's another application that you can run in your Hadoop cluster alongside with MapReduce, Storm, Spark, Giraffe, HBase, and so on and so forth. OK, so how does it look like? So as a, as a user of the system, what you get is an abstraction <clears throat> that is called uh, a data set and some operators. So you can imagine a data set as being you know, a list of things, of elements, as you would you know, in your favorite programming language define a list. However, this list now is distributed in the cluster. I mean, you don't have to know about it, and it doesn't have to. You can also run this in a laptop, but the system automatically partitions this in the cluster, and you can apply operate, operations on all this list, uh, and the system processes these operators in parallel. So the classic uh, thing. Um, what are the operators? Uh, you know, the usual uh, operators inspired by functional programming, so MapReduce, uh, there are native joins, co-group, union, uh, filter, flat map, group reduce. Uh, there are two operators that, as far as I know, are unique in this system, so iterate and uh, delta iterate, do this iterative algorithms with loops, uh, and a lot more. So if we are actually adding operators uh, you know, constantly, and it's actually very easy if you want to contribute to the system to go and add your own. It's, it's very, very easy. Uh, and the nice thing is that you can mix and match them in any way you can, in a, in a direct acyclic graph, uh, and you can also put some loops uh, in, so, in some uh, points, so it's not in the in some map reduce in the sense that you have map and then you have reduce, but you can basically build your program in whatever way you want using these operators. Um, how it feels to program it? So this is, for example, you know the classic uh, map reduce example word count in Java. So what you do is that you have this execution environment object that basically dictates, you know, are you going to run your program in the cluster, and your local machine, what, where's the address of the master, and so on and so forth. So by changing essentially this line, you can go from testing to your laptop to uh, running it on the cluster. Uh, and then, as I said, you get this data set type. This data set is parameterized you know, with the type of the, of the elements. These are strongly typed. Uh, all the Java types uh, are supported, the primitive ones. Uh, Java objects, so Java classes that you define are supported. Uh, we provide tuple types, so this is an example of a tuple of two elements, string and integer, and then you apply transformations like flat map, group by, count, and so on. 
Uh, and these transformations take as uh, argument this user-defined function that you write. So what is this map or reduce going to actually do, which is down here. So pretty easy. Uh, now, the other thing to note is that, uh, you know, in contrast to if you write this in plain Java, instructions are not executed one by one, but you can imagine that there's some kind of lazy evaluation going on, which means that the system will take this program, it will optimize it, it will compile it to a completely different new representation, and then ship it to the cluster. And this happens when you hit this environment uh, execute. So pretty simple, that's the same thing uh, in Scala. So there's right, right now a Java API and a Scala API in the system. Uh, we're working on a Python API uh, and, and a few more. Uh, so Scala, same thing essentially, you basically use lambdas instead of uh, defining new, uh, new objects like in Java and it's, it's more concise because the language is more concise. Okay, so word count is a classic example, but you know, actually there are better systems to, to do word count. Uh, the point is that, uh, you know, you can do more stuff. So this is, for example, a small example of, a, of something like a SQL query. So you're joining here three tables. This is how you do it. So you have a table called large, so you can read them from CSV files, dot join, where you define the keys of the join. You can optionally define its own function, so on and so forth. So it's, it's pretty okay. You can group by, do dot max, and so on. It's not only for, so this is a relational style processing. Uh, you can do a bit more, I will tell you uh, in a bit. So this, uh, I talked about this iterate operator. So this is uh, a different operator from average use, et cetera, in the sense that you can use it to loop over the data. So what you do, so it's essentially a fixed point operator. What you do is you define a data, a data set on top of which you are going to loop many times. And inside this operator, you put as argument a step function, which is an arbitrary uh, stratosphere program. And this will go and loop until a termination condition is met. Using this, you can do, for example, you know, some graph algorithms, or you, know, you can do also some clustering, so on and so forth. So this, for example, here, a transitive closure example, where you have basically a set of edges in the graph, and you want to find uh, you know, which nodes in the graph are reachable by, uh, by each node. Uh, and what you do is that you repeatedly join uh, the current paths of length, let's say, one, two, three, four, with the edges to produce the bigger paths, you union with the old paths, and you do this again and again and again until you have found everything. So you can express that you know, quite okay, quite elegantly with this iterate operator, uh, and that's it. Again, that's the same thing in Scala. The language is more concise, the program is more concise. Uh, another primitive is what we call this delta iterate operator. Uh, the main idea behind this is that you're going to define an iteration using two things. Uh, so you will have something called a work set, which will drive the work in the iteration, and you will produce changes or deltas to your set, which are here. So if, you, you know, if you're familiar with data log, this is similar to semi-naive evaluation. Uh, and what it actually, the, what it really does is that at every time you look over your data, you don't need to change all the elements, okay? But you just need to change a few elements in the data set that actually change in the iteration. So this is along the lines of what Google's uh, Pregel or GraphLab, uh, this kind of vertex-centric systems are doing, and in fact, this is a generalization of Pregel in the sense that you can express Pregel in, in one specific stratosphere program. Um, and this is exactly what we did. So we, we wrote an API that is uh, very similar uh, to Pregel or um, Giraffe. We call it Spargel, which is the German word for asparagus. Uh, and uh, you can use this together with all your map reduce and so on operators in the same program so you don't have to change systems, move your data through HDFS, and so on, so on, so forth. So you have one API, one system, you get the, you know, the same performance, and you just call this, this vertex-centric iteration. 
And this, this was implemented essentially on top of this program in less than, than 500 lines of code, excluding tests and comments. Uh, so pretty powerful abstraction. Uh, so what you can do is essentially you can get a lot of the stuff that right now you get in separate systems, you can get them in one system, you can mix and match these APIs together according to what you want to do, and all the, the whole program will be passed, optimized, compiled, and executed by one system, so you gain a lot in performance. Okay. Now, uh, a few words of how, how it works uh, internally. So this is the stack. Uh, so Stratosphere essentially sits on top of third-party storage and cluster management solutions. So it sits on top of, so right now we, uh, the system supports, you know, reading files from the local file system of your cluster or your machine, uh, HDFS, S3, it has a JDBC driver, and it has its own cluster manager, but you can also use uh, Yarn uh, or you can run it on EC2. And the system, is, so these are all things that, you know, we don't do. Uh, what Stratosphere consists of essentially three layers, the API layer, uh, the optimizer, and the runtime. Uh, so the API is essentially how you program the system. Right now, as I said, there's a Java API, Scala API, Sparkle, the Graph API, there's a scripting language, and people are working on a Python API, uh, on a SQL interface, uh, on data streaming on top of it, and on porting uh, Mahout, which is a machine learning uh, library slash domain specific language uh, for Hadoop. Uh, and then under that is the system's optimizer and runtime. Okay, so what do these do? So the main idea of, of having an optimizer is, bro is, is borrowed by uh, SQL databases, but it actually it took quite a bit of research to port this technology to uh, this more general world where, where you don't have SQL, you don't have tables, but you have arbitrary types. Uh, so what is what you need to you know, uh, take away is the way you write your program, as you saw in Java, Scala, and so on, is not the way that the system executes the program. So actually the system takes this and manipulates it and transforms it into a completely different representation uh, that uh, will run efficiently. And what the system, uh, for example, chooses is whether you know, between two operators to stream the data or to write out the data and read it again. So this is called pipelining versus placing dumps. Whether an operator like reduce or join will be executed using a sort-based strategy or a hash-based strategy. Uh, how to partition the data, right? So in which machines to place the original uh, data scans close to, the, close to where the input data is, then how exactly to partition it for the next phases and so on and so forth, whether, you know, to partition, broadcast, round robin, how to do this uh, exactly, uh, how the data, the intermediate data will be in memory, so the system will use all the main memory that, uh, that you will give uh, to it, but if that's not enough to process uh, the job, it will gradually spill to disk as necessary uh, very gracefully, and you're not gonna, you're gonna see, of course, a performance here because it goes to disk, but it's not gonna blow up. Uh, why, you, why do you need that? Uh, so there, there are a few people that, you know, arguing that you don't need such a component, so th this optimizer is not needed. I, I disagree, and the reason is that, you know, if you see textbook uh, examples or examples that people saw in their slides, actually the examples that I showed in my slides, right, they're pretty small programs, they are basically one algorithm, there's little, there's some optimization potential, but it's not huge. Uh, in reality, people are building, uh, you know, in production, very long pipelines using this system. And when you and when you give people, you know, a powerful abstraction that they can basically build arbitrarily long programs, they will use it, and they do. Yeah. Uh, and programs get pretty big and pretty complex, and it is very very hard to hand tune these programs. So this, I, I believe that this technology can be, you know, very useful uh, in this case. And the other effect of, you know, having this kind of automatic optimization is that essentially what you do is that you write your program, you test it on your laptop, it runs in one way, then, you know, you can move it to your test cluster, 
where you have a little bit of data, all the data is in memory, it gets, another, it gets executed another way, but it will, and then you know, one, month, one month later, you can move it in your production cluster, or one month later, your, your data has actually evolved, right? So there are new values in there, there are new files, and so on and so forth, and it will still run. So it reduces the need for, for hand tuning. Okay. So this is an example of an optimization. So here, again, we have something that is very uh, SQL-like. Uh, so what we do is that we are uh, filtering, joining, and grouping, and after uh, you know passing through the optimizer, what the optimizer will do is figure out how to place, how to execute grouping and joining using one shuffle step. So you get basically a reducer or an aggregation here for free. You don't need to repartition your data. Um, so very few words about the runtime. So as I said, this is a hybrid MapReduce and parallel database runtime. Uh, it is, in fact, internally a streaming engine, so the, the data does not have to be written out to disk or memory and then read back again. It has uh, a little bit of a push model inside where the data is pipelined between operators. Uh, it has uh, support for these stateful multipass algorithms uh, with this delta uh, iterations operator. Essentially, what happens there internally is that data is indexed using a hash index, uh, and we are doing updates on this index. So you get stateful processing under the hood while still keeping a functional abstraction uh, at the top. Uh, heavily in memory, so you can exploit main memory in modern machines. Doesn't blow up if your memory is not enough. Uh, the architecture of the system follows the classic uh, you know, master worker paradigm like MapReduce. So you have a master called a job manager that does all the coordination. Uh, and the workers, uh, you know, execute the work. It's not very interesting here. Uh, what might be a little bit uh, more interesting is that in contrast to other systems, this database-inspired backend, uh, one aspect of it is that internally data is not stored in the form of Java objects, but they are serialized byte arrays, uh, and uh, they are stored exactly as byte arrays or pages. This makes spilling to disk uh, very, very efficient. This makes network transfers more efficient. So for two reasons, first of all, uh, the actual data <coughs> uh, consumes less space in memory because you don't have to pay the overhead of, uh, of objects. Uh, and second, uh, you can do your own memory management inside the system, and the system does that instead of using uh, Java's uh, garbage collection. Um, and what, uh, <clears throat> what we are trying to do is write essentially operators uh, that can work directly on this binary representation rather having, than having to deserialize and serialize the data uh, all the time. So this is this, is this database-inspired backend approach. Uh, iterative processing, how it is done under the hood, so how these iterate and delta iterate operators are implemented. So the way this is done in Hadoop is essentially if you want to run an algorithm that makes many passes over the data, is that you write a driver program and you repeatedly issue MapReduce jobs. And then, you know, the Hadoop MapReduce executes one job, writes the result to HDFS, and when the driver knows that the output is ready, it issues the second job, and so on and so forth. So this is very slow because you have to exchange data uh, through a distributed file system, which is not the most efficient way uh, to pass data. Uh, other, other systems like Spark uh, improve a lot on this in the, in, the, in the sense that they do not cast the data in the distributed file system, but they cast it in memory. So every job submission will read the data uh, from memory. Uh, Stratosphere takes a different approach uh, in the sense that the iteration is not done in this client driver program, but it is done as a feedback loop inside the system. Uh, and what is good about that is that up here, the sy these systems don't know that you're running one program. They think that you're running many completely independent jobs. Here, the system actually knows that this is one program, it is an internet program, and in many cases, it can do uh, some relevant optimizations because it has the knowledge. Um, excuse that one. So this is an example of an optimization. So this is an iterative program finding the connected components of a graph. 
So for example, what the system does for you automatically is figuring out what parts of the job will be constant among the iterations and uh, casting that. So that will be cast in memory and will be read every time. It will figure out work that needs to be done and it is the same at every iteration and will push it out of the loop. So here, for example, it pushes one uh, partitioning step outside the loop. So all these sorts of things can make the performance uh, you know, much, much better without the user having to worry about this at all. Okay, so I don't have much time. Uh, and I would like to, to finish early so that you can actually get lunch on time. I just want to tell you, you know, very, very few words about, uh, about the project structure and uh, and what are we doing and what are people doing. So the last major release uh, of the system had 26 uh, contributors, a lot of them from universities in Europe uh, uh, and some from companies in Europe. A lot of them are in TU Berlin, but uh, there, there are others uh, also, at, for example, in RIA, in Budapest, uh, in some companies uh, in Germany and so on and so forth. Uh, it is, Stratosphere is a mentoring organization in Google Summer of Code 2014, so we, get, we got some students to work during the summer and contribute to the system, that is great. Uh, we are seeing uh, the first companies that are adopting the system and using it, so there is a company based in Berlin uh, called ResearchGate, so if you are an academic you have probably been, sp been spammed uh, by them, so that's... <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's their way of spending zero dollars on marketing. However, it is a very interesting company in the sense that they have very, very nice data about all the publications, institutions, authors, experiments, uh, actually researchers in the, in the physical scientists are using this a lot. Recently there was a stem cell uh, discovery or so that was first revealed in ResearchGate rather than in Nature. So this is it's not happening, they're not very popular in computer science and engineering, but they are very, very popular in the physical sciences where people are sharing also the results of failed experiments with each other. Uh, so, they, so they are using the system. Spotify, Deutsche Telekom, is, is evaluating the system, uh, not yet using it in production, but evaluating in test clusters. Uh, it's a very active open source project, so it has 40 contributors, the, the community, is very active, passes every day, discussions every day in the mailing list. Uh, the way it is gov so this is not, okay, so it, Stratosphere.eu, so Stratosphere was never a European project, actually, I don't know why people chose uh, .eu address, but <laughs> um, <clears throat> just to clarify, so uh, the project is now an Apache incubator project, so it's not controlled by any one like me or like uh, any university or any uh, funding organization. It is a democratic, uh, you know, it's democratically organized. The committers and the mentors of the, of the project have, have binding votes. That means that everything that we do is uh, open and public. So all discussions are public on the mailing list. Uh, all commits, everything is, is public open source. Uh, and that is <clears throat> very nice and can be very relevant for people that are looking for, of course, for open source uh, projects to contribute, uh, to get you know, good karma points and, uh, and make their, their city better. So we are looking for uh, contributions. Some things that people are, are working on right now. So uh, we are working on uh, redesigning a little bit the runtime to introduce mid query fault tolerance. This is going to come up in the next release. Uh, and th with that, we can also get the ability to have interactive cells or incremental plan roller, which is essentially when you write a program, you don't have to just write a program, ship it to the cluster, and then get the result back, but you can do that very incrementally. You can say, okay, at this point, send this to the cluster, give me some small result back, I'm, I'm going to take a look at it, then I'm going to send something else, and so on and so forth. So this kind of interactive processing. As I said, we are working on a Python API, on data streaming, uh, on full uh, Hadoop MapReduce compatibility, uh, on uh, porting Mahout, which is a machine learning uh, library on top of Hadoop, porting that on top of Stratosphere, and porting Stratosphere on top of Tez, which is a project uh, in, again, the Apache uh, incubator, which is, again, a very scalable uh, distributed engine, but 
at a lower level. So it's not, it does not have these compilers, optimizers, and APIs. It's just a distributed system. Uh, I just would like to mention this, stratosphere streaming, because that's very recent, and that's a very nice result that came actually from the EIT ICT labs. So this was done by a partner university in, uh, in Budapest, uh, ELTE. So they implemented, this is the first very, very alpha experimental prototype of a data streaming API on all the systems. So it looks very similar as you're writing a batch program. Uh, you just call it data stream rather than data set. And the nice thing was that they already got uh, performance that is better than Storm in a single uh, core. So in, in the distributed setting, it's, it's, uh, it's still slower than Storm. We have some problems there, but uh, it, it, it seems to be uh, working uh, very nicely. And, uh, and they will, of course, continue and, and port that in the system. Um, what is, so I would also like, I mean, since being here, to mention that the support of, of the EIT was, was also uh, very helpful for Stratosphere in the sense that uh, that's how, you know, the small community got started. So contributions came from Budapest, from Inria, uh, from KDH, and now we can see, you know, people that are coming to us as the project is getting more active and asking on ways to contribute. Uh, the EIT has these companies inside them. That, we, that they connect us to so that we are currently working with, uh, with Deutsche Telekom and with F-Secure on you know, uh, finding use cases that they can use the system in production and so on. Uh, so if, if, you know, if you're interested uh, and you're a developer, uh, you know, please uh, contribute. We're you know, a very open and friendly community and we're definitely uh, looking for contributions, and we're looking to, to add committers in the project uh, as the time goes by. Uh, if you're a company that you know has a big data problem, and you have you know seen, for example, that Hadoop is too slow, or your engineers don't like the way that they program Hadoop, uh, we are also looking to, to partner with uh, with companies uh, and you know help them implement their use cases and use the system. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for, for your, your inspiring and very interesting talk. Uh, I've got a question about, because you, you said that uh, basically at the crossroads between uh, technologies coming from the database world and technologies coming from more the map produced world, um, is, is consistency or different levels of consistency uh, an objective of the uh, Stratosphere project? And uh, if yes, uh, in which respect, what are your plans, and what do you see as roadblocks and challenges along the way? Right, so I should have clarified that. Uh, no, they're not. Uh, so Stratosphere is an analytical platform, and when I was referring to database technology, I was referring to analytical database. So parallel analytical databases, you know, think Greenplan, think Teradata, and so on and so forth. So we are not currently doing any kind of transactions, and we don't plan to do so in the immediate future. I, I have just one question. Uh, Joa presentation and Joa technology is very nice and very interesting. Uh, but um, have you make comparison with uh, data entity and uh, Linku technology or Microsoft? Because I see the uh, so in about St. Articular which objects of your technology uh, have uh, some similarity with the LinkQ or technology of Microsoft? Have you uh, with, make, with, uh, with, Can you repeat with which technology from Microsoft? LinkQ. Ah, link, Link, yeah. Uh, link. So this is definitely inspired by Link, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan. Uh, there will, I'm not sure if there is, uh, if we can make a comparison in terms of performance. I'm not sure if there's something from Microsoft that uh, is usable right now. There was this Dryad Link project, but I'm not sure what is the status of that. I'm not sure if Ant is here and he knows a bit more. Uh, but uh, no, we haven't done any comparisons. Because, yeah.
Yes, uh, can you comment on some use cases uh, that have been uh, treated in particularly efficient way by Stratosphere, where we have uh, made a significant advance? So, I wouldn't say that, you know, this is the use case that the system is, is tailored for. So, uh, you know, you definitely want to do things that are more complicated than a map reduced job. Yeah, uh, you probably don't want to scale to thousands, to tens of thousands of machines because it doesn't work. Uh, if you are doing things that involve this kind of iterative processing, then the system is, is very good at it. So it's a, it's a very general system. So it will it will it will be faster in MapReduce than Hadoop, and it will be faster in more complex stuff than Hadoop MapReduce. Okay, so uh, let's uh, thank you, Costas again. Thank you.